This year, I've started and scaled multiple dropshipping stores to well over six figures a month combined, and I've even scaled some stores to over six figures a month alone and ended up selling those stores for a nice chunk of change, and that's why I'm moving out of this dump soon. Now, in this video, I'm gonna teach you the step-by-step -step blueprint that I followed that took me six years to learn to be able to start all these new stores this year and scale them to over six figures so that you can just take the exact strategy, the exact principles, the exact thought process that a seven-figure dropshipper uses to evaluate products, build websites, create ads, so that you can take your current store and scale it to over six figures like clockwork. Because it truly is not that complicated of a process. And honestly, even a chimpanzee or a high school expelli with a lukewarm IQ and borderline Asperger's could still execute. Because in business, I truly believe simple scales. And whoever focuses on the basics, no matter how boring they may be to continually do over and over again, are the ones that win. And I've read books from millionaires and billionaires. And whenever I'm trying to look for some golden nugget piece of advice, you don't tend to get it because it's always just who does the basics the best, who is focusing on the skills, the boring things that actually make money. Because right now, if you're on YouTube, you're looking for some dopamine hit. You are looking for some golden nugget strategy, some tidbit, that is going to change your current trajectory that you feel like you're headed towards in your dropshipping career because you're probably feeling a little bit demotivated, a little bit beat up by the fact that you haven't made it work yet. And you're wondering, why is everyone else successful? Well, first off, that's not true because 99% of people fail when they're doing this. So the fact that you stayed this long in the game and you're still watching videos and you're still taking that effort to learn is already a promising start. But most likely what is hindering you is not committing fully to a strategy. Because I truly believe almost every strategy and guru out there in this dropshipping space, and there's so many, I mean, there's a new one every single day, they're like fleas, has some sort of strategy that works. If you stick to it long enough, and if you learn how to execute at a high enough level, you'll be able to make money. Because my first mentor, Dan Henry, who I joined his program when I was 18, I paid him 10K, which is almost everything I had in my bank account, taught me that in business, 90% of results come from execution and 10% comes from strategies. Strategies are simply overrated. Now in this video, I am gonna give you a blueprint. I am gonna give you a strategy, but you have to commit to it and truly believe in it if it's going to actually serve you in any way. Because if you just try one or two products with following this and it doesn't work and you move on, then it wasn't the strategy's fault. It was your lack of belief and your lack of patience and trust in it. You have to trust the process. So when it comes to strategies, and one of the best analogies I heard to really just nail this in my brain was that if I was making a movie and I was trying to find my Leonardo DiCaprio, my main actor, and I gave 100 movie actors the same script. The one who's going to get the part is the one who executes it the best, even though they all had the same strategy. So fundamentally, the dropshippers who are going to be successful and make money by the end of this year are going to be the ones that actually exhibit the right behaviors and habits, not the ones who had more information or knowledge. Because the reality is you have enough information available to you. You just need to stay committed and be able to overcome the constant obstacles and hurdles that are going to be thrown your way. Because when I look at one of my best students this year, Matt, he scaled from zero to 20K a day in three months. And all he did differently than you was that he took the typical dropshipping timeline of the amount of work that a normal dropshipper does in two years, and then he squeezed it into two months. He dealt with ad account bans, payment processor bans, DMCAs, testing over 20 products, and nothing was working. But because he had such a great speed to implementation, because he was continually testing products and not getting attached to them, being objective, testing them with the right methods, with the right foundation, with the right website and with the right offer, he kept doing the right actions over and over and over again. And through doing that, he eventually got the right product that with all of those other things combined was able to thrive and he scaled to 20 grand a day. But it took doing the right actions every single day. So the first mindset shift you have to have, if you want to get to my level, which took me six years to learn, is you cannot be motivated by external 
outcomes. The money will come if you focus on the boring things. But if you're constantly focused on the money and chasing it, then all you're going to be doing after a year is still chasing it. We all know the analogy. If you want to catch the butterfly, you build a beautiful garden, not continually chasing it. Now, what does building a beautiful garden mean in terms of dropshipping? Well, that means learning the skills that attract money, which is learning how to evaluate products, learning how to build product pages that convince people that have never heard of you to buy from your brand and see the value in your product, and then making ads that get their attention in the first place, that call them out directly and showcase the value and use cases of your product. And then media buying. And then also managing teams. And then a variety of other skills that you'll learn as you get into this process. But don't overwhelm yourself. You need to take action because taking action and doing the thing is what's actually going to help you progress. Learning about the thing is not doing the thing. Studying and taking notes about what dropshipping is and how to execute is still not doing dropshipping. This is just learning masturbation. You are just procrastinating. You have to take the right actions. So let's first talk about what those right actions are. How did I get to this place where I have this blueprint? And what is this blueprint that I've used to scale up so many products this year? Well, let's break it down first through product selection. When you are dropshipping, I highly recommend you test a large volume of products. Don't spam test and just test products willy-nilly with crappy websites and crappy ads. No. Try to test two products a week. So you dedicate three days in the week to one product and three days of the week to another. Take Sunday off because you need to reset mentally. You need to be able to relax, calm down. That's actually another thing I learned from a European mentor because I never took a day off. But then I realized Sunday, that's my great reset day. I can watch football. I can turn my brain off and I recharge so that I can really destroy the next week. But in those three days when you're working on a product, really focus on what sections do I need to convince someone that they need my product? What benefits actually matter to my customer? What can I do with my product images to make them branded, to communicate the value, the use cases, the problems that my product solves? What can I do with my description to be more convincing, to have better headlines? How can I research my customer at a deeper level to truly be able to put myself in their shoes, to handle any objections that they have? to know what offer is gonna to speak to them and make them wanna buy. What pricing is the right pricing? Because all those questions you only will be able to answer through putting in the reps and learning through your testing. The easiest and fastest way to learn is by testing, not by learning by watching videos or courses or mentorships. You have to do the thing. Now it's up to you to determine what environment you need to be in to take the right actions consistently because for a lot of people that does involve learning from a coach one-on-one. -on -one. I know for me specifically, I was doing things alone for the whole first year I did dropshipping. And that's why I don't like to compare journeys because you're probably in a place where you're me. I mean, you maybe have been doing this for a few weeks, a few months, maybe a year or two. I'm year six guys. I'm an unk. Do you see these wrinkles? God, it's getting bad. I need to get the Botox as soon as possible and the lip injections. Well, oh, I'm turning into a pumpkin, a rotting one. But you can't compare where you're currently at to where I am because my skills and the amount of volume and just the amount of experience that I've accumulated is completely different than you. I'm a few stages ahead. Now, if you want to get to my level, you need to focus on celebrating those small wins, tracking the progress of the skills that you've developed, understanding from test to test, what little things can I change? What can I improve on? What can I iterate on, on my website, on my creatives, the way I do my media buying? What little changes? What did I do wrong if I'm really being objective? And it's only just by analyzing your KPIs that you can be truly objective as to what you're struggling and lacking in. If consistently your website's not converting, then you have a website issue, my friend. You do not know how to write the right descriptions and come up with the right offers. So you're most likely gonna need some outside help. If your ads are continually at $2 a click and they're not getting people to convert, then you have an ad problem, my friend, and you need to learn and study more winning ads, try new hooks, try new visuals, try new concepts, and ideally have someone that can look at your ads and tell you what you're doing wrong as well, getting that direct one-on-one -on -one feedback. And that's why I love mentoring. Now, I'm not trying to pitch my coaching or anything. I'm just telling you that's usually the fastest way to learn. Now, 
getting back to my blueprint, what do I do when I first evaluate products? I personally do love problem solving products the most. I think that's the easiest sell and you can also charge a premium pricing because you're solving premium problems. I don't want to be the guy that solves a very, or that sells a very generic product where my main value of buying from my store is that it's the cheapest because there's always going to be someone that's going to go cheaper than you. That's going to cut the margins more. And if you're just in a continual race to the bottom, then you're going to have no margins to actually run ads and scale the business. So I prefer selling a problem solving product that is a need rather than a want for someone because it solves that key insecurity that could change their life. It adds huge amounts of value, thousands of dollars worth of value for a product that only costs them 30 to $50. Those are the types of products that work for me personally. Now I'm only going to tell you what works for me and you have to figure out what works for you because maybe it is clothing that ends up being the thing that works the best for you. I don't know. For most dropshippers in the beginning, it is easier to do non-problem solving products because it doesn't require you to have any marketing skills. It's just, do you like the design? Oh, you do? Okay, buy from my website. It's as simple as that. But I truly believe the long-term money, the long-term equity, and where you really develop your skills as an entrepreneur is through creating a brand around a problem-solving product. That has longevity. That is more evergreen than some fad or trend or design that anyone can rip and you have no moat over. Now, when it comes to suppliers, that's another key part of the puzzle that a lot of people overlook. Your margins play a huge part in what offers you can create. And your offer is going to be the number one most valuable asset you have on your website to differentiate from your competitors. If you do not have good margins, then you're going to create boring offers that do not appeal to your customers. So make sure you're getting quotes from Commerce, from CJ Dropshipping, from private agents. Have different contacts available to you because it's an incredible resource to be able to provide your customers the best shipping experience and also make you more profitable. So I personally have two different private agents and I believe the best way to get a private sourcing agent is have them recommended or learn about them through a referral from another e-commerce person that you actually trust. Now that can be through joining a discord group. That can be learning from a one-on-one coach. That could be through networking with people online, but that's typically the best way to learn and get those contacts that you're going to need to be able to scale in the long term. Now on the website side of things, just don't overcomplicate it. When I test a product that is a problem solver, I almost have the exact same template each time where I focus on having a high converting offer, having a great above the fold section that lists the different use cases, has custom product images, has emoji benefits, has a sub description that calls out the main problem. And here's why our product is the best solution, has some elements of social proof in the images, and maybe a highlighted customer review, has some urgency with the announcement banner or limited stock or a countdown timer on the offer. Those are the key elements on the above the fold. Then in the middle, in the description section, I usually like to have three description blocks. So a multi row where there's an image on the left, text on the right. Then the next section, text on the right, image on the left. And then the final section, text on the left, image on the right. Those images are always going to correspond to the ideas I have in those description blocks. So I have three description blocks. The first description block is all about the problem. Identify the problem, make people aware they have a problem and how big that problem is in their life. Otherwise, they're not going to feel compelled enough to buy from your store today and have that impulse buy. Then after you identify it, aggravate it, make them realize how much of a problem it is, then introduce your product. Then second section, use cases. Here's where you can use the product. Here's where it'll add value. And then third section, here's what your life is going to look like once you have it. Future pace. Talk about other use cases, other benefits that it, where it can add value to your customer's life. Fourth section, handle objections. Have a good FAQ section. Have good highlighted customer reviews that also handle objections like potentially sizing or if the product actually works. Because if you don't have good social proof, then people aren't going to believe your claims, even if they're the exact right claims and benefits that you should be saying. You have to have an element of believability, and believability only comes from having great social proof. So you have to really put an emphasis on that. You also have to have a good risk reversal because that's part of your offer. If I tell you that if you do not get the benefit that this product provides within 30 days, that you can get a full money back, then you are going to be much more inclined to buy from me. When I look at the best offers out there, and this is a completely different offer. This is in the consulting space. There's a guy named Kai Bax. And Kai Bax is a great offer where he says, if I do not help you get benefit, which in this case is getting you more clients. If I do not help you get 15 new clients in the next few months, 
or the next 90 days, so a specific time frame, I will refund you the full amount you paid me and give you an extra $3,000 for wasting your time. Now, if I'm someone who needs clients, that is a very compelling, irresistible offer. So a lot of times your guarantee is something that every beginner dropshipper overlooks, but that could honestly be the thing that doubles your conversion rate. And that's why I see Noro and a lot of these really good problem solving dropshipping brands in their first product image, they say get benefit or your money back. So it's something you may want to consider. And that's something I consider when I'm making my offer and I'm thinking about my copywriting. It's not about the website design, people. It's not about how pretty your color scheme is or your logo. It's about do you truly understand what it is that this product can do for your customers? What benefits they truly care about? Who is that target audience? What matters to them? And then communicating those ideas through your copywriting, through your FAQ, through handling objections and reading their mind. And that's what's going to get them to convert. And of course, have a good speed score. Make sure that that doesn't take too long to load. Over four seconds is a big no-no. Those are the fundamentals. Those are the only things I think about when I'm testing a product. Now, I test two products every single week on almost the exact same template that I told you right there. There's very little difference. Now, sometimes I might have a us versus them section. I may have a results section where it's the statistic block of 90% of customers reported that they got X, Y, and Z benefit. 95% have reported they got this. That's another section I do like, but it's almost all the same. There's so many different ways to show social proof and there's so many different ways to show that your product actually works, but you need to have sections that do show that. It's up to you how you want to do it though. When it comes to ad strategy, you guys, if you watch my videos, you know I'm very different compared to everyone else. I do believe in volume. I do believe in giving yourself the most opportunities to make a product work. Now that comes, there is a silver lining to that. I don't want you to create so many ads where it takes you too long to actually test a product. If it takes you over a week to test a product, that's a problem. It should take you three days max. So if you can only create, let's say five ads in a three day period, then all right, test that product with those five ads and see if there's some life because in those five ads, there should be a pulse. There should be some ad to cards. There should be some good link clicks to then give you the reality check or give you that pulse that, oh, this is worth putting more time and energy into. Now, ideally in those two to three days that it takes to prepare a product, you'll be able to create 15 ads because with 15 ads, then there's a no brainer shot that you gave that product the best chance to work. If you did three to four different marketing angles and three to four ads for each marketing angle to talk to different audiences, to try different messaging, to try different hooks, to try different visuals, to split test, because as a marketer, the best thing you can do is split test and then react to the data to understand what was actually working. It's the same thing with your website. You should also be split testing your offer as the main big split test, because that's going to be the biggest lever on whether or not your product page works or not compared to everything else. So my ad strategy is just about making those creatives and letting them thrive. So I do ABO when I'm testing on both TikTok and Facebook, because I can then guarantee spend to these creatives and give them a fair shot, give them a fair shake to actually prove themselves. With a CBO, you don't do that. A lot of the creatives get neglected. So I don't like that. Facebook, a lot of times, and TikTok will pick the wrong creatives. They will allocate your budget to creatives that are not as good as the ones they neglect. So it makes sense to give each one a fair shake. Outside of that, when it comes to my ad strategy, when I'm testing, whenever I have a product that after the first few days made some purchases and maybe it's break even, I'll evaluate what creatives got me those purchases. And then I will create new ad groups in the same campaign in that ABO that are variations of my winning ad, that have new hooks, that have new visuals, that have maybe a different body. But you have to have these metrics, these KPIs to determine what is going right with your ad and what is going wrong. Because if you can't diagnose that, then you have a problem and that's where you would wanna get a one-on-one coach that can teach you, here's the metrics that actually matter. Here's how you can tell what needs to improve. Because if you don't know what you're looking at, if you don't know what the numbers are telling you, you can never actually scale. But fundamentally, that should be what your ad and testing strategy is. Try to make as many craves as possible within two to three days. I'd say 15 to 20. 20 is the max I would ever test. I think above 20, there is a trade-off with the time and energy compared to the results you'll get. But that's a solid, solid test. And that's how I test every product nowadays. Now, when it comes to scaling, how did I scale to those levels? All I do, my favorite scaling method right now that I haven't talked about too much is 
in that initial campaign, so it's an ABO, where I have that winning ad group with those winning creatives, I will duplicate it three to five times in the same campaign and then just do a higher budget so that I can put more spend into what is working. Because how you scale is you have to allocate most of your budget to what's working and then a percentage, maybe 20 to 30% into new ideas, new ads, new creatives to see if you can get even better ads that are more profitable to put money into. Because the more winning creatives you have, the higher you can scale. The only difference between a store doing 50K a month and a store doing 500K a month is usually just the amount of winning creatives they have that they can put more money into. That's the only difference. And the only way you can get more winning creatives is you double down on the boring things of just making new creatives to test every single week. If you only test five new creatives a week, then you might have a chance to get one new winning creative. But if you test 10 to 20 new creatives a week, then you're probably gonna get two to three new winning creatives that will allow you to spend another $1,000 on ads and be profitable with that. $1,000 a day and be profitable with that. Now, in terms of how do I actually manage having multiple brands that are scaling? I do have very set in stone SOPs and I do hire the right people. So for all of my brands, I have a product researcher that knows exactly what type of products that I like. For my website design, I have a website designer that I'll pay 40 to $50 to that knows exactly what template that I want to use and how to communicate the value of my product. And I will teach them because they're first never going to get it right. When you're working with anyone, they are never going to be perfect. So you have to train them. You have to coach them. You have to give them feedback. And as they get more feedback, as they learn your personal preference, that's when you get dangerous because then any product you find or that your researcher finds and you approve, then your website guy knows exactly what to do. Your ad team knows exactly what to do as well. So you should have one editor and maybe a creative strategist that can write the scripts and then just contact your editor, tells them that here's the visuals that we need to have for the script. Here are the ads that we're going to need to prove and validate if this product is a winner. That is the ideal team structure a researcher, a designer, an editor, and then a creative strategist. That's all you need. And then maybe a customer support VA. Yeah, I'd say that also matters too for those little nitty gritty details because you shouldn't be doing customer support. When you're the CEO, like I am, my main focus, and I'll teach you, and you've probably seen this. If you watch my Week in Life video, which I highly recommend watching, you'll see where most of my time goes. And a lot of time it's meetings. And I'll actually tell you what we're doing on those meetings. You try talking for 20, 30 minutes straight and not getting a sore throat. Jeez Louise. I'm the throat goat. All right. So when I hop on these meetings with my team, all we are doing is just looking at the numbers. All right. Website, last seven days compared to the seven days before end. What has changed? Did our conversion rate go up? Did it go down? Did our AOV go up or did it go down? Did our revenue provisor go up or did it go down? All right. Next, upsells. How are upsells performing? What split test did we do with our upsells and which version is doing better? Downsells, which one's doing better? So let's say, for instance, I'm selling a water bottle. All right. Last week we did 30, we did 30K in revenue. Our conversion rate was 3%. Our AOV was $30. This week, it was 35K in revenue. So it was an increase. Our conversion rate went up to 4% and our AOV stayed the same. Cool. Well, we'll analyze what did we change to get that bigger jump in conversion rate? Was it new ads? Because it's not always just a website thing that changes to make that conversion rate go up. It could be we just had better performing ads. Or maybe we did try a new offer and that's why our conversion rate bumped up. So, okay, let's stick with that new offer and then let's make a second version of that product page or maybe instead of changing the offer now that we know that offer is solid let's change the description let's change the product images let's change another variable because we don't have the perfect version of our product page we never will it's an endless pursuit of perfection that will never be accomplished but you keep iterating and keep improving to get one step closer to that ideal perfect version same thing with your creatives i then go to my ad account all right what did we do how are we scaling what did the campaigns do this week compared to last week? What are, what are our cost per click numbers? What is our CTR? What is our hook rate? What is our hold rate compared to last week? What has changed? All right, with the new craze we tested, how did they perform? It's just getting a pulse on every of the key aspects, every element of the key aspects of your business. All right, customer support. How many tickets did we have? How many returns did we have? What were the main complaints that people had that led them to returning or wanting a refund? Can we... Look at our average response time and improve that. 
How many tickets actually got completed? All right, we're good. Supplier, what are our current quotes? Are we shipping out products in a, mean, in a meaningful time, doing it within one to two business days? You just talk to your team, you get these reports, and then through these reports, you think of what are the action steps we need to do this week to scale operations and make it more efficient. That's all you need to do. That's all you need to focus on. That is what I have done to scale brand new dropshipping stores from zero to six figures and have multiple stores running at the same time. They're all continuing to scale and have teams that are running them for me rather than me fully being dedicated to them and being run by my own businesses. I am the CEO. I work on the business, not inside the business. And that's the fundamental transformation that you will make once you have the skills required to be able to identify the right products, create the right websites, and create the right ads to make any product a winner.